Zapotec Indians believed that fungi would emerge as a response to lightning striking the earth. Now, we understand that mushrooms exist to release spores into the environment. But why some produce psilocybin has yet to be explained. I've been fascinated by psychoactive drugs my whole life. I love to study their chemistry and impact on society. And my work has allowed me to investigate extraordinary substances around the world. Yet there are still mysteries that remain. They grew in hiding for hundreds of years. Now, their fruits are ready to be seen. This is the story of psilocybin containing mushrooms. hoping to interview a clandestine mushroom grower for months, but expected them to be a secretive and untrusting bunch. I knew I'd have to use advanced investigatory tactics to infiltrate their inner circle. So it was on Instagram that I found a mushroom syndicate named Mycomob who I knew possessed the skills and experience to tell me about the inner workings of the underground mushroom trade. A few PMs and emojis later, I was on my way to meet them, eye to eye. Driving to this undisclosed location that I will not name on camera because it houses one of the largest clandestine mushroom grow rooms in North America. This grow room is capable of producing tens of pounds of mushrooms every week. Oh, wow. Very nice. Do you want to tell me about all these tubs or what's going on right now? What am I looking at? Well, these are all mono tubs. Just uh, the one strain golden teacher going on right now. Why Golden Teacher? It's a good strain that people will enjoy and stuff like that and rarely have bad trips from. What is the demand? Very high. How high? Well, we can sell them as fast as we grow them. Since the beginning of clandestine mushroom cultivation, virtually all growers have favored the same species, Psilocybe cubensis. It's not the largest or the most potent, but it's highly adaptable to the needs of humans who control its artificial propagation. After decades of genetic manipulation, these strains won't survive in nature without the human hand. And humans couldn't have bred them without the guiding hand of nature. How does someone learn to do this? Internet, lots of research, lots of trial and error. It seems very friendly to me, but I guess this is also a somewhat sketchy thing. It's definitely still legal. That's why we're wearing masks. Like a room where a surgical procedure is performed, a mushroom grow chamber must be almost completely sterile, as sterile as possible, because any contamination that enters these bins could destroy the entire crop. And this crop represents months of work, years of research, and thousands of dollars. Oh, wow. Some pretty decent-sized pins. It'll be full-size mushrooms within a day, maybe two days. Just the fact that you have to disguise your identity says a lot about this sort of work. What do you think about the laws surrounding mushrooms? Well, I think they were created by people who had no idea about anything about mushrooms. Most people that do make those laws, they've never tried these things. They're probably the worst person to ask, the least informed. Could you tell me a little bit about how this sort of work differs from other realms in the drug dealing world? Well, uh, I'd say it's a lot safer, that's for sure. Being a meth dealer and a heroin dealer, you'd definitely be uh, <laughs> susceptible to a lot of the dangers of the street, right? Like, mushrooms are a pretty calm market. People don't really have, like, battles or wars or 
It's not really as contested over as a lot of other drug markets. It's more peaceful. Oh, for sure, yeah. Have you heard anything about the way people use these mushrooms in Mexico? Ritualistic ceremonies. What do you know about them? I don't know much at all. Have you heard about Maria Sabina? Nope. No. What is that? She was an important mushroom shamaness who was considered responsible for introducing mushrooms to the world outside Mexico. With the international abundance of psilocybin containing fungi, it's hard to imagine that a mere 60 years ago, their existence was only known to a small number of indigenous healers. But that was changed by the work of a Mazatec shaman, Maria Sabina. Hola, me llamo Hamilton. Estoy en Huautla de Jimenez, un ciudad muy famosa por los hongos mágicos. Permiso, señora. Uh, ¿Ustedes sabe un casa de María Sabina? ¿Sí? ¿Qué es? Gracias. ¿Usted sabe dónde queda la casa de María Sabina? María Sabina. Sí. Hola. Permiso, señora. ¿Usted sabe dónde queda la casa de María Sabina? No, está lejos. Aquí en el hospital. Ah, sí. Allí es. Gracias. Ajá. Vamos a la casa de María Sabina. Oaxaca is one of the poorest states in Mexico, and these indigenous regions are especially poor. They are high in the mountains, and it's certainly not convenient in terms of accessing the rest of the world. So it's an unlikely place to be as developed as it is. They have internet here, there's hot water and electricity, and most of that is thanks to Maria Sabina. Maria Sabina was a locally renowned shaman who used mushrooms ceremonially for spiritual and diagnostic purposes. But she became world famous when she introduced her mushrooms to a banker named Gordon Wasson, who wrote a widely read article about the mushrooms in 1957. This led to the Western world's first exposure to the concept of magic mushrooms. Countercultural celebrities like John Lennon, Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, and to a lesser extent, Pele, are reported to have made pilgrimages to Waula to experience one of Maria Sabina's famous mushroom ceremonies. As a result, Waula de Jimenez became the most populous and prosperous town in the Sierra Mazateca. At the home of Maria Sabina, I met with her grandson, Filagonio Garcia, who studied under her as a child and became a mushroom shaman himself. But now I understand that no one in Wautla is collecting their own mushrooms. How does that work? Don't 
I left Filagonio with the hopes of observing a mushroom ceremony, but at the height of the dry season, the crucial ingredient was missing. Huala is an unusual city. It's famous for mushrooms. People come here to undergo traditional mushroom ceremonies. They come here to buy mushrooms, but it's not a place people go to hunt for mushrooms. The spots where the mushrooms grow are very secret. They're places that the shamans don't necessarily even know about themselves. There are a small number of people in this community that go out into the mountains and they collect mushrooms and they don't tell anyone where they find them because that's their source of income. There are three species of mushroom recognized by the Mazatec shaman. San Isidro, or Psilocybe cubensis, Pajaritos, or Psilocybe mexicana, and the Durumbe, which can be either Psilocybe cairulescens or Psilocybe zapotecorum. But finding them in the wild has proven to be difficult. I met with a local mushroom enthusiast outside my hotel, who told me he didn't know where they grew, but suggested I talk to an artist who uses mushrooms to inspire his paintings. Un hongo en el ojo. Okay. Me gusta. The artist showed me his work, but also didn't know where they grew, and told me to talk to his friend Jose, who composes mushroom-inspired music. Jose played me a few of his songs, but said he hadn't seen fresh mushrooms for months, and mentioned a friend named Charlie, who had. Great. Thanks. Charlie had been indulging in cane spirits. Yo llevo ahorita como cuatro días, cinco días, día y noche tomando. But assured me I wouldn't have trouble finding mushrooms for a ceremony. Que nadie les diga que no, no, no. And offered me the phone number of a local named Gerardo. When I texted Gerardo, he responded with a photo depicting Kru lessons of unspeakable enormity. And so the hunt began. The next day I met with Gerardo to discuss his tantalizing K. Rulescens photo, and he told me of a private mountaintop garden where the mushrooms grow. Maria Sabina's great-grandson was as interested as I was, so he tagged along. Y de la caña sale, pues, el bagazo ahí se tira y entonces ahí brotan esos niños que ayer este, les mostré. Esta es la gran caminata para sacar todo lo malo que hay dentro del cuerpo. Es colesterol o cualquier cosa. Del cigarro aquí sale todo. Hola, señor. At the top of the mountain, we arrived at the home of a man named Malfo, who was cultivating mushrooms in a fenced-off garden, fertilized with sugarcane pulp. Oh, wow, there's actually hundreds of Psilocybe Kirillescens. They're the largest I've ever seen. They're just enormous. Textbook Psilocybe Kirillescens. With the hygrophonous cap, you can see that the margin is two different colors from moisture, and they are absolutely amazing. They're very potent by weight. They contain high levels of psilocin and psilocybin. It's chulada de de hongo, no? Sí. Ya tiene toda la hora. I've never seen so many of this type of mushroom before. It's amazing. This mushroom is very rare where I come from. Oh, well, we to first there, no, man. Why are these mushrooms so large? Sería esto el principio de la sabiduría, el principio de la sabiduría para que lo tomes con 
con fe, con fe lo tomes. No le quites la tierrita, ya sé. Todo. ¿The whole thing? Sí. Hay que comer esto. Todo. Mmm. Well, that's nice. Hey, gracias. Así es del tamaño de del Dios, el Rey de Reyes y el Señor de Señores, ¿no? Como dice la Biblia. ¿Te puedo dar un abrazo? Ah. <laughs> gracias. Sí, yo te agarro la escalera. Sale, sale. Ah, ahí va. No tengas miedo. No tengas miedo. No tengas miedo. Oh, wow. It's a lot of dried mushrooms. So you are you are able to dry these mushrooms. Ten ounces of dried Celestia K relaxins up here. This really is a magical garden that you have. Unbelievable. Are these all from this season? So I think this is where the cane processing goes on. And I can already see probably a hundred drying mushrooms over here on this altar with a depiction of Jesus. And here there are thousands more. Your friend who brought me here was encouraging me to eat the mushrooms outside of a medical or ceremonial context. What do you think of that? Hmm. And that's an internal thing? I do that silently in my head? So I'm starting to trip from the mushrooms that your friend gave me. What do you think I should do? Far from the city center of Huautla, Amalfo lived in relative isolation. He spoke no Spanish and truly believed mushrooms are a sacrament that should never be exchanged for money. All these mushrooms were just picked from the garden, and they're amazing looking. As a parting gift, he insisted I take a bag of fresh Celosibi K. Rulescens from his garden for ceremonial use. People that love mushrooms, mycophiles, have their own rituals and traditions when they hunt for mushrooms. One of them is taking spore prints, which aids identification, but also allows someone to save the spores of the mushroom, which is the entire biological purpose that the mushroom exists. It allows you to propagate the mushroom, it allows you to verify the identity of the species, and it's one of the only ways of preserving something that otherwise begins to deteriorate very quickly. Spore prints have been used to identify mushrooms for almost 200 years. But not everyone is using spores for taxonomic analysis. Fungi reproduce by releasing spores into the environment. Like seeds, the spores germinate once they've found a suitable substrate. But unlike seeds, they're haploid and require the genetic material from another spore to produce a dikaryotic fungus capable of sexual reproduction. A single mushroom can release tens of thousands of them into the environment. What I'm doing here is putting some spores on a couple of sterilized agar dishes that I got here. Agar is a gelatinous growth substrate obtained from seaweed that's widely used for isolating pure cultures. Cyanesin spores. Later, I don't know, craft knife, scalpel thing. In nature, 
Fungi can live in harmony with other organisms, but when isolated from their natural environment and placed on high nutrient media, the presence of competing microorganisms creates a fierce battle between the desired fungus and a diverse ecology of contaminants. Most of the stuff that I've learned is just general information on the internet that I've, I've just done experiments with other things and different variables and came up with a method that works. I'm gonna wanna scrape up some of this print. Several prints. It's a ton of prints. Whenever anyone collects mushroom spores in the wild, they can be used for this sort of a process to inoculate either agar or even grain and then you can select a strain and transfer it into a suitable growth substrate. These are from nature, so it's pretty hard to tell how clean they're gonna be or any of that. Craft knife down, screw the tops on. After an agar wedge is removed and has been used to inoculate a jar of sterilized grain, the jar is ready to spend the next month in a dark room where it begins to colonize. The mycelium is a dense web of microscopic fibers that can be seen by the naked eye as it engulfs and consumes its substrate. Welcome to our abode. <laughs> oh, wow, this is huge. This is where the magic before the magic happens. The mycelium is growing from one grain to another. It's taken over the whole jar. It looks beautiful. You know, it just looks flawless. How many jars are here? Down here, they have enough to make about eight more totes. So, totes. After we uh, clone them jar to jar, or we put some spores in there, they all come into here so that they can inoculate. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Cleaning stuff, shaking up these jars, fanning them. So why do it? Growing shit. Everybody loves growing shit. People like watching babies grow and shit. I like watching these babies grow. <laughs> but uh, that and the money, you know? There's another type of mycophile who cares not for cultivation, but for the thrill of discovering new species in the wild. Here's a little marasmius. Oh, wow, look at that, Arascalpium vulgari. This is an amanita from section Vahinate. Oh, wow, that is Salasopi mexicana. Amazing, it's the first time I've ever seen this. Alan Rockefeller has been studying the distribution of Salasopi in Mexico for more than a decade. There's a really cool Zularia. Another Amanita from section Lepidella. Some of these are deadly and others are edible. Is that Amanita muscaria? Huh, it is. A new species of Mexican bioluminescent mycena. Yep, Satharella. Satharella. This is something I've never seen before. Holy moly. That's insane. Is that part of the fungus? Yeah. What? What is this? I don't know. Uh, does someone have a bag for this giant dangling cluster of Pseudofistulina? Alan travels each year from his home in Oakland to Mexico, where he spends months photographing and discovering new species of fungi. It's a very unique habitat in that the clouds come in about 3 p.m. every day and the whole place fills up with fog. And it makes it a really interesting and diverse place for plants and mushrooms, too. How did you find this location? I spent a long time looking for it. Um, we drive around the different cloud forests of Mexico. And whenever you see a landslide, you check the bottom of the landslides near the river. So the place we're going in is over here. When did the interest or the obsession with mushrooms begin? I was walking in the forest, I um, just took a hike, and there was mushrooms everywhere. And I wanted to learn which ones were poisonous, which ones were edible, which ones were rare, which ones were psychoactive. And so I just started taking pictures of them and bringing them home, doing spore prints, and studying. 
we're going to have to cross to get in there because you can't really pass there. I've written a lot of Wikipedia articles and edited a lot of Wikipedia articles. And I like to take really nice pictures of mushrooms and put them into Wikipedia. Or were you interested in the psychedelic mushrooms before any of this? I was interested in the psychedelic ones, but it's not really my favorite thing, and the edibles are not really my focus. My focus is really cool, rare stuff, species that people have never discovered before, and just really interesting, unusual, beautiful-looking mushrooms. You know, I'll be here in Mexico in the, for about four months, pretty much camping out every night, hunting mushrooms all day, and then doing the microscope work in the evenings around the campfire. These are just glorious. They really are. It's probably the most beautiful psilocybe in the world. And this is the best spot I've found in all of Mexico. Flaco stem is really distinct in Zapotecorum, and the veil remnants around the pilus margin, dark purple brown spore prints that are all over the caps that are adjacent. And here's a cool spore print on the stem. And you can see brew bluesing right there. You can see Zapotecorum is almost the only mushroom that grows here. And it's not a coincidence. Um, they really like these landslide areas, but not a very fresh landslide. They like landslides that are a few years old. It's one of the largest, one of the most beautiful, one of the most potent psilocybin-containing mushroom species, and I've never seen it in nature before. It's truly a glorious thing to behold. This is one of the original ones that was used by the Aztecs, right? Yeah, and the Zapotecos. It's named after the Zapotecos. And it's pretty hard to find. In Mexico, the use of psilocybin-containing mushrooms can be traced back to ancient civilizations like the Aztec Empire, where they were consumed in conjunction with ritualistic suicide and human sacrifice. Ah, this is Echemnopilus subpurpuratus. This is a species that has psilocybin. At the University of Guadalajara's Fungarium, I met with mycologist Laura Guzman, daughter of the legendary Gaston Guzman, the leading expert on the taxonomy of the genus Psilocybe. Mi papá era uno de los que identificó el hongo que representan en una cueva en España como Psilocybe hispánica, una especie alucinógena y que entonces se pensaría que a lo mejor bajo la influencia de los efectos de ese hongo tuvieron visiones que ellos plasmaron en las cuevas. En una pintura en una iglesia en Francia es una manita muscaria. Entonces piensan que tanto Adán y Eva lo que están ahí consumiendo no es la manzana de ese árbol, sino es el hongo alucinógeno que le hizo tener esas experiencias espirituales y de ahí el surgimiento de la, de la religión. And this also is hallucinogenic, has psilocybin in that. This was described in many years ago. 1909. 1909. Wow. Yeah. One of the projects that I had with my is the origin of estiércol de ganado, entonces no puede ser una especie nativa de América. Tiene que haber sido traído probablemente de África o de Asia. Primero se introdujo a Cuba. Por eso un micólogo norteamericano que lo descubrió ahí le puso psilocybe cubensis. The discovery that psilocybe cubensis in the United States produced the same effect as the San Isidro of Mexico sent a new generation of mycophiles onto private cow pastures. We've got two pastures next to each other right there. A friend of mine's got the other one. And I was going down through there, I looked out in, in Bill's pasture. This guy's walking around after with a bag. I let him get about from here to that fence from me right there and said, what are you doing? They had that rifle. That poor boy, it scared him so bad. Oh my gosh. And I said, how'd you get in here? And he said, I walked across from those apartments over there. I said, well, get back across that road and don't come over here again. Conservative farm owners were dismayed to find the dung of their cattle was the preferred substrate for a mind-altering drug. Why don't you want people on your land picking mushrooms? Because it's a liability. They go in there and get hurt and turn around and see you. And I think it's a stupid thing to do. 
I don't use drugs, and I don't think anybody else should. I think it's a drag on society, and um, you get these people that are addicted, and um, then all they want to do is lay around and do damn drugs and don't go to work and collect welfare. So From mushrooms? I don't know what it is. Maybe you start on mushrooms, and then you go to marijuana, and next thing you're on crack, or I don't know. It's a, maybe it's an entry drug, you know. <clears throat> do something. Don't be on getting out here and making mushroom milkshakes or whatever they do with it instead of going to work. You know, I'm, I, <clears throat> there's too many good things to do in life besides that. Without a history of shamanism or training in identification, the mushroom pickers of Florida have still forged a relationship with the fungus. Uh, in the state of Florida, I mean, it could go all year round. It really depends on our rain season and our winter. If our winter doesn't come in harsh, you pick all the way around from January to January. How did you become interested in mushrooms? Um, I guess you could say I kind of one day, I don't really know exactly how to put it, but just felt like it was time to go pick some mushrooms and try, try to see what the whole, uh, I guess you could say the trip was about. After that, more, more of my friends started talking to me about mushroom picking and stuff like that, so got me uh, hooked on it after a little while. After that, it was more spiritual than it was of a medicinal use. You know, I wasn't using it just to get high from mushrooms, but instead using it to seek more knowledge. Energy fields, I guess you could call them. Psilocybin is definitely something a lot of people seek. The interconnection. Wouldn't be proud of it, but I started selling them a lot too. Most of my things with mushrooms that I've come to knowledge is all off based off theory and experience and small amounts of research. I'm not too, uh, too good in the school. Didn't do good, do good in school. Glad I didn't drop out. Exciting, exciting. Sweating up a storm, sweatily walking through this cow pasture expecting cow dung for the presence of Psilocybe the cubensis. And there's one of those white ones. And here's a nice golden top one right there, beautiful. This is a really gorgeous one. It's a nice, elegant, fully opened cap. There may have been another mushroom growing above it. There's almost a ring of purple around the margin. This is a classic textbook Psilocybe cubensis. Always flick it. This is a field of nothing but Psilocybe cubensis. Florida, Psilocybe cubensis land. I never understood how people have bad trips on mushrooms because of the overwhelming joy that I feel every time I do them. It's weird because it's not like ecstasy where it just like pumps you full of happiness and then you come down and you're sad. It's like, it's like a lasting peace. There's a vehicle coming down this trail. That thing sounds like an excavator. I recovered my non-psychoactive Paneolus antelarium and returned to the hunt. Do any of you use mushrooms with your family? And would you like to do that? Yes, definitely. Definitely. That would be awesome. It'd be an awesome experience just to take it all in, see how they react on them, see how they uh, maybe inform me while, while under the influence of psilocybin. What maybe some words of wisdom that they could possibly give me would be pretty cool to see what they'd, you know what I mean? You might be more philosophical. Exactly. While most Americans wouldn't consider the psychedelic experience something to be shared with family, amongst the shamans of Woutla, it would be unnatural to do it any other way. Masavina. 
Thank you, Maria Sabina, for allowing Gordon Lawson into your home. I think that hundreds of thousands or millions of people have benefited because of your generosity and the way that you shared information with outsiders, which is a good thing. 31 years after Maria Sabina's death, the use of psilocybin is being recognized by the medical establishment for treatment of depression, cluster headache, OCD, and addiction. And as I head to a ceremony with Filagonio, I remember that medicinal use in his family is where it all began. Top of the hill overlooking Huautla de Jimenez, Filagonio is preparing a ceremony for his son, who's struggling with alcoholism, his wife, who's losing her eyesight, and me. I have mild psoriasis. The ceremony begins with Filagonio cleansing the mushrooms I gathered from the sugar cane garden with smoke from copal incense that's been used as an offering to the gods since the Aztec and Mayan Empire.
Hey, <laughs> Ese así tanto se avienta, no sé todo dónde está. <risa> Por ese uno y dos, nada más, yo y uno medio ya. Ese número uno, lo más fuerte. Sí. El número uno. Solo Porque uno. es uno de caña. Sí, solo uno. Uno, es dos, no, sí, se hace todo a tu lugar. I thought it was nice. This sort of psychedelic use could bring many families together. I'm sure there's families all over the planet that would benefit from this sort of ritual, sitting in a nice shack in the rain, burning incense and candlelight, and sitting together and talking about health problems and eating mushrooms and feeling better. By tracing the history of psilocybin-containing mushrooms, I've seen the way Maria Sabina's greatest contribution has changed our culture, and in turn, the way our culture has changed the mushroom. It's very clear that Mycomob and their tubs and jars, Riley and his cow pastures, Filagonio and his family, Alan Rockefeller and his taxonomical quest. Oh, wow, look at that, our Scalpium vulgari have all furthered the human-mushroom partnership in their own way. And when we become a society that can embrace the mushroom, then, and only then, can we embrace each other. Gracias.